Okay, uh, welcome to chapter seven, uh, Courts and the Quest for Justice. Uh, this chapter, again, we're going to cover this in about uh, 40 minutes. Uh, this chapter is very near and dear to my heart, in part because uh, we're now in the section of the course that I consider my real area of expertise. I've um, been a professor of criminal law for 20 years, but I've also been a practicing attorney here in North Carolina for almost 30 years. So uh, this is something that uh, I have a good familiarity with, and I sure hope that uh, I can uh, share some unique insights on it. All right. All right, first and foremost, when we talk about the functions of the court, um, now, again, like most presentations that we talk about, uh, this is not an exclusive list. There are other things that the courts do, but let's look at the ones your book highlight and some of the things that you certainly need to know. Uh, first of all, it is a due process function. Uh, that is, in theory, the courts are designed to protect an individual's rights, um, because remember, um, you do not exist for the benefit of the state, rather the state, by that I mean the government, exists for your benefit. So it is um, important that when the individual faces an accusation by the state, a criminal accusation by the state, that his rights are protected. The second function of the court, and this is what most people think courts do, is to deal just with punishment and stopping criminal con uh, conduct. So we call that the crime control function, and certainly that, that's very important. Uh, a third, and this is something that emerged in the 20th century, um, and to some extent even earlier, is the rehabilitation function. That is, what do you do when you catch someone and you determine, yes, they did indeed uh, commit a criminal act. And finally, bureaucratic functions, the things that the courts do that may not be directly related to what we would think of as justice, but are important nonetheless because they have to do with how the courts function. Okay, some basic principles to talk about, and I'm going to add a term here that you need to pay attention to, and that term is venue, V-E-N-U-E. -E. All right, more about that in one second. Uh, first of all, jurisdiction. Jurisdiction is the authority of a court, and I want you to add a word here to your notes, a court system to hear a case. Um, venue, that term I just talked about a minute ago, is the particular court inside that system. So uh, as an example of those two terms and how they interplay before we get to types of jurisdiction. If you were to commit a homicide in Raleigh, North Carolina, jurisdiction the authority of a court to hear the case, court system as I told you here case, would be the criminal courts of North Carolina. Venue would be the specific court that you would go to. In this case, did it in Raleigh, it would be Superior Court, County of Wake. Okay. How is jurisdiction established? Well, traditionally, uh, jurisdiction in the criminal sense is geographically based. Um, that is, court's jurisdictional authority derives from the location of the criminal act and where the court sits. Commit a crime in Raleigh or in Hickory or in Durham, the jurisdiction is the criminal courts of North Carolina. If you committed a crime in Miami, Florida, uh, North Carolina would not have jurisdiction. They wouldn't have the authority, typically, to try you for that case. Um, Sometimes we say concurrent jurisdiction. We mean by that that multiple courts will have the authority to have a trial or a case. Um, a quick example, and this exists in many cases, is that both the federal government, the federal courts, have jurisdiction over crimes, and the state courts could have the same jurisdiction. So let's suppose you assaulted an FBI agent in Raleigh, North Carolina. The state of North Carolina, let's suppose you shot him, the state of North Carolina would have jurisdiction, assault with a deadly weapon, inflicting serious injury. That is a criminal case for North Carolina. There would also be a statute, I assume, a federal statute, assault on a federal law enforcement officer. So both North Carolina would have jurisdiction over you and the federal government. We call that concurrent or shared jurisdiction. International jurisdiction, of course, courts' authorities usually are limited to the country within which they sit. It makes a degree of sense, much like a state's jurisdiction is limited to the state. 
subject matter jurisdiction doesn't apply as much in the criminal sense that we're talking about. Typically, when we talk about general subject matter jurisdiction in a criminal trial, it means that you committed any crime under the statute. Limited subject, juris matter, uh, subject matter jurisdiction, a little bit rare for um, criminal cases, but it could be something like a specific type of subject matter crime which gives rise to a specific court having jurisdiction. So if you assaulted an FBI agent, in our previous example, um, that would trigger a limited subject matter jurisdiction assault on a federal law enforcement officer to allow the federal government to try you. Okay, now we've talked about jurisdiction, let's talk about the two courts, two types of courts. The two primary types of courts are trial courts and appellate courts are the second type. So trial courts are what we call courts of original jurisdiction. Original jurisdiction means that they will hear cases, will have trials, or they can have trials, at which evidence is presented of guilt or innocence of the suspect. Um, they will determine issues or questions of fact. Did Bob shoot Fred? Did John steal the money? Um, appellate courts, on the other hand, generally do not make determinations of facts. They may review facts and see how they apply, but they are more interested, almost exclusively interested in, questions of law. So they review appellate courts, trial court cases, and then they see if those trial courts acted within the boundaries of the law. Unlike trial courts, appellate courts typically will issue decisions. So you will actually have a written decision from an appellate court which is published. Um, there are trial court records, but they're not routinely published. You, you can get access to them, but appellate court records, on the other hand, are published. And they have traditionally been published in books, uh, but now, of course, much of this is available online. And in these published, what they're called as opinions, they're the record of the court and how the court decided, they're going to say, okay, here's the law, here's how we followed it. And it's the judge's opinion. All right, we do have in the United States a dual court system. It has both a federal and a state court component. Now, federal courts enforce federal crimes, and there are, in your book states, of almost 5,000, 4,500 plus federal crimes. And it can range all the way from something very minor um, to uh, something very, very serious. State courts, like the state of North Carolina, enforce state law or state statute. So law and statute is an interchangeable term here. Um, the distinction between the two is not always clear. In many, many cases, both the federal government and the state government have concurrent jurisdiction. They both can try a case. And interestingly enough, and this is something that most students don't understand, this does not raise the issue of double jeopardy. If separate sovereign entities or separate court systems are holding trials, you cannot say, well, the federal government can't try me because under double jeopardy I was already tried by the state. And neither can you say, well, the state can't try me because under double jeopardy I was tried by the federal government. Since they're separate entities, the um, double jeopardy clause of the Constitution is not triggered. Okay, this is a breakdown of the uh, federal court system. Um, and you'll notice, and I'm going to bring in a little arrow here if you can see it, here's the United States Supreme Court. Here are the two systems, and I'll talk about how North Carolina's uh, is, and I'll change some of this, but here's the federal. United States Supreme Court, highest federal appellate court. Remember, only here's issues of law. U.S. Court of Appeals, sometimes called the circuit courts. Again, this is an appellate court. Down from there, we have the only regular trial court that the federal government has. 
and those are the US district courts now there are some specialty courts you'll see them over here bankruptcy federal claims <coughs> excuse me international trade and tax also federal agencies such as the IRS um, can appeal their decisions to the US Circuit Court over here and, and let's change the names of these so that they apply to North Carolina the highest state court in North Carolina is called the North Carolina Supreme Court down from them we have the North Carolina Court of Appeals and we actually have two trial courts we have for handling felonies we're just going to talk about criminal generally it is North Carolina superior courts and then the local courts which would handle misdemeanors typically are North Carolina district courts we also have uh, state agencies that have trial so whereas the federal government only has one general trial court US district court we have two and we split it into superior court which is on this green graph here state trial courts of general jurisdiction and district court this handles felonies this handles misdemeanors okay now um, are there magistrates courts in North Carolina yes there are we have um, smaller courts we have uh, disposition courts or magistrate courts and these are going to handle um, very minor uh, issues they can handle things often like tickets they can handle uh, landlord disputes very simple cases um, they usually have a geographical basis of the county within which they sit and in North Carolina the magistrate is appointed by uh, one of the sitting uh, district court judges I believe senior district court judge uh, appoints the magistrate if I'm not mistaken in North Carolina uh, you also can have some problem-solving courts increasingly the courts have experimented with having unique courts such as what are called veterans courts that handle issues where veterans coming back have issues sometimes triggered by things like PTSD you can have drug courts um, and it name is self-explanatory there or domestic courts and those would be things like uh, divorce and separation and sometimes even uh, some criminal cases uh, abuse uh, cases uh, uh, domestic assault cases it, it depends different states have gone different ways on this trial courts generally have different or general jurisdictions so we call them in North Carolina if you look at that district courts if they're handling the misdemeanors and the more minor cases sometimes also just issuing some orders or superior courts if they're handling important ones um, North Carolina like um, about three-quarters of the rest of the states have an intermediate appellate court that's called the North Carolina Court of Appeals and then of course we also have the North Carolina Supreme Court um, again this is the structure for the federal court system you have the only trial court system that they have and that's the district court then you have the US Court of Appeals and the really the highest the big dog as you would say in North Carolina the highest of the courts the United States Supreme Court okay this is a breakdown of the geographical boundaries of the federal courts. so you'll notice here and if you'll look at the little arrow here North Carolina is in what is called the fourth circuit so we sit with South Carolina North Carolina is here Virginia West Virginia and Maryland in the fourth circuit so the fourth circuit is our appellate circuit um, you also notice that since there's a lot of people in North Carolina we have a western district uh, a middle and a middle district and an eastern district so we broke North Carolina up into three because there's a lot of people that live there South Carolina with fewer people not as broken up uh, New York is broken up into multiple jurisdictions because a lot of people live in New York uh, California is broken up but you have some states like Wyoming uh, Montana that are only going to have uh, one sitting district court okay let's talk about the United States Supreme Court the Supreme Court of the United States sometimes called SCOTUS uh, S-C-O-T-U-S Supreme Court of the United States is uh, an extremely important um, court the most important court in the United States it makes 
policy in two ways. That is, it changes the law, it changes society. It does this through a doctrine called judicial review. It also affects it by interpreting statutes. So, as an example, judicial review is the authority of a court. And this is not limited to just the Supreme Court, but it can be applied by some other courts. It's the authority of a court to declare a law unconstitutional. So the Congress might pass a law, the President might sign a law, but the court says, I'm sorry, that law is invalid. It is pretty rare for a case to get to the Supreme Court. It's exceedingly rare for it to start there. Um, sitting on the Supreme Court is one Chief Justice, or Chief Justice currently is Chief Justice Roberts, and nine Associate Justices. Now, how do you get to the Supreme Court? Well, first of all, it's not automatic. You don't automatically get there. There is no automatic right of appeal. Thousands and thousands of cases are filed with an attempt to get to the Supreme Court of the United States. And they only hear a handful, less than 500 cases, far less than 500 cases. When the Supreme Court decides they're going to accept a case, um, they will issue what is called a writ of certiorari. This is Latin again. A writ means an order, and a writ of certiorari is an order to a lower court to send up the records to this upper court, to the Supreme Court. And generally, the Supreme Court of the United States will not issue a writ of certiorari unless four of the nine justices say they want to hear the case. And that's known as the rule of four. Okay, the Supreme Court does not hear evidence. And this is a misconception that many people have, that, oh, well, evidence is presented in the court as to whether uh, someone did or did not kill someone in a murder appeal. That's not how it's done. What happens is each side, um, the appellate and the appellee, file a written argument. And that argument is called a brief. Now, the Supreme Court may ask, and usually it is done, that the attorneys who wrote the brief, or at least the senior counsel who wrote the brief, comes in and presents those briefs to the court and answers questions and makes a brief argument about it. The justices then go back and they will decide what should happen. So if the chief justice is in the majority, because they, they will take a vote, if it's, say, 5 to 4, or 6 to 3, or 7 to 2, or 8 to 1, or a unanimous decision, if the chief justice is in the majority, he will pick one of the justices who's voting in the majority and say, okay, I suppose it's Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Ruth, you will write the decision. If he is not in the majority, if he disagrees, but five or more of the other justices say, well, we don't agree with the chief justice, then they win. And the most senior judge there, say it's Alito or uh, Justice Thomas, will decide who gets to write the opinion. Um, sometimes justices agree for the same reason. We call this a, a un well, if all justices agreed, all nine, agreed for the same reason, unanimous decisions, the best decisions you can get. An example of that would be the late 1950s, early 1960s, when they were writing cases about school desegregation. The most famous is Brown versus the Board of Education. This is the Kansas City Board of Education. In that case, there was a nine to nothing decision that said, you have got to desegregate public schools with all deliberate speed. Sometimes justices will agree, it's a unanimous decision, but they'll agree for different reasons, and that's called a concurrent decision. And sometimes justices disagree, and that's called a dissenting opinion. Okay, let's talk about the actual trials. Judges are very important. They're very important particularly before trial, although I would argue that prosecuting attorneys are probably more important before trial than judges. We just saw an example of that with uh, Mr. Smollett in um, Chicago, where the uh, 
prosecuting attorney basically dismissed charges against him. But a judge has a lot of power before trial. Uh, one of the things that judges like to do is they like to get people to settle cases. There's not enough time to have, there's not enough judges to have, all the cases go to trial. So very often judges will try to get the defense attorneys and try to get the prosecuting attorneys to work together. Certainly to limit what they're going to fight about, to agree to certain things like, okay, these are the witnesses that you should call, this is the evidence should be presented. During trial, the judge is a little bit more neutral. He's supposed to be a referee. He enforces the law. He also can explain points of law to the jury. He's also got administrative duties. He's got to keep the docket current. He's got to keep things moving. So the judge has all these powers that he juggles. Now this is in the abstract. In the practical, particularly lately, judges tend to favor the prosecution. The reason for this is quite simple. Increasingly, most of our judges are coming out of the prosecutor's office. So if you look at uh, sitting appellate court judges, sitting superior court judges, many, many, many of them are ex-prosecutors. This is true in North Carolina, it's true in other states. It's true in North Carolina because in part uh, the public wants to elect people who they feel will be hard on crime. Alright, federally the way judges are selected is the President of the United States appoints the judge. There is then a hearing by the Senate of the United States and the judge is confirmed or he is not confirmed. Now, there's been some fights about this recently. You probably know that President Obama, for example, um, nominated someone uh, for the Supreme Court, uh, but the Senate of the United States just refused to review it or even vote whether that the individual should or should not. What they were waiting for was a Republican to win the, the presidential election so that they could appoint someone. So what's happened is the president still has the power to appoint, but unless his party is in the majority in the Senate, um, very often the Senate just refuses to process judges. And this is something that is going on. Um, and it's really been a change, a sea change in the 21st century. North Carolina, we'll talk about North Carolina primarily, we have an election, we have a partisan election for all our judges. Our district court judges, our superior court judges, our court of appeals judges, and our North Carolina Supreme Court judges are all elected popularly. Voters go in the booth, they'll see two people running for office, Usually they'll be identified by, and it's varied a little bit over the last 20, 30 years, but they're identified by the political party. They'll say, John Smith is running against Jane Doe or Superior Court Judge in Wake County. One is a Democrat, one's a Republican. Vote who you want. Um, now, typically, and I believe that District Court Judges have a four-year term, and I think Superior Court Judges have a six-year term in North Carolina. And then both appellate and Supreme Court judges have long terms as well. Um, not everybody does that. Not every state does that. Some states, they let the governor appoint them. That's pretty rare, but it happens. Sometimes there is a merit selection process whereby the government appoints them, but then people uh, confirm them. Okay. Um, diversity on the bench. What are judges like? Well, there is a lack of diversity. If you think that men are only 50% of the population and whites are about 70% of the population, that would mean that white men constitute about 30 plus percent of the population, but they represent twice as often, 66% of appellate judges. So white male judges, and I'll, you could even go further, white male Christian older um, people are judges. Women, young judges, minority judges, not as common. Uh, what's the problem with this? Well, there is a benefit, much like we talked about the benefit of diversity um, for the police, there is a benefit for diversity from the judges. If judges are all white, if they're all male, and you have defendants, or you have prosecutors, or defense attorneys who are not, and they do not um, win their cases, 
then um, they might feel they're being cheated. Uh, we have a Supreme Court case right now uh, going on where a black man was accused of uh, homicide. And uh, now this is a white prosecutor in Mississippi. He has been uh, accused and actually it has been confirmed that he excluded blacks from the jury in uh, some of the trials. And of course this re led to distrust uh, of the criminal justice system by minorities inside Mississippi. Or maybe reinforced distrust is, is more proper. If judges also are white, and if white judges are upholding what this white prosecutor did, again, it creates the idea that, okay, the, the system's rigged, the system's not fair. All right, let's talk about the courtroom group. Remember that this is, like the police is a subculture, the courtroom group is a subculture. So the most prominent members are the judge, the prosecution, and the defense attorney. We're all attorneys. We all were educated in law school. We've all practiced law. So we have a lot in common. We're probably in the same economic class. Uh, we probably have a lot of the same background and experience. Which means that even though we have an adversarial relationship sometimes, defense attorneys and prosecutions, we also have so many commonalities that it's not necessarily a vicious competition. There are other participants. You can talk about the bailiff providing security in the courtroom in North Carolina. That's provided by the sheriff of the county within which the court sits. Clerk of court and the court reporters uh, that process both paperwork and keep records. Uh, the judge, your book says, is the dominant figure. That's not really true. In North Carolina, the dominant figure is quite clearly the prosecuting attorney. Uh, some judges give a lot of leeway to the defense or to the prosecution. Uh, these are called laissez-faire judges. Your tight ship judges are, put a lot more restrictions. Judges usually learn the facts of the case as they're presented by the attorneys, so we provide the information to them so that they know what's going on. All right, the prosecution, and in North Carolina, the prosecutors are elected. The district attorneys uh, are elected in the counties within which the court sits, and they, are, they act in the name of the people. They are the most powerful actor in the system. Now, they wear two hats in theory. They, they wear a hat that says they are to seek convictions, but they are also supposed to seek justice, so they have a duty of fairness. Um, one of the areas where this kind of conflicts is what's called the Brady Rule. Because most defendants are poor, and most defendants cannot hire private investigators to people to, do, to find evidence they did or did not commit a crime, um, defense attorneys have to rely upon the police, which cooperate with the prosecution, to develop evidence. So, um, as a defense attorney, I might say, okay, I need an analysis of the fingerprints that were found at the scene of the crime. I need the records from the police. Under something called the Brady Rule, it comes from a case called Brady v. Maryland, if the prosecution had evidence gathered by the police that there were fingerprints at the scene of the crime that were not my clients, not the person on trial, but somebody else's, say another possible suspect, another possible murderer, they have to turn that over to me. They have to give it to me. And this is the Brady rule. They don't always do it, but they're supposed to. The prosecutor has different names. At the federal level, we call them U.S. attorney. At the state level, um, you do see it sometimes called state attorneys for the Attorney General's Office of um, North Carolina. But we generally call them district attorneys, DAs, or assistant district attorneys, ADAs, in North Carolina, if you got a lot in different county. Prosecutors have discretion. What's their big discretion? Well, the first one is, should they charge someone? We just saw an example of that. The President of the United States, um, recently there was a, what's called the Mueller report. The, Mr. Mueller investigated. He did not find collusion uh, with the Russians. But he said there was evidence, and he could not make the determination himself, that the president had obstructed justice. So he turned that over to the Attorney General of the United States. The Attorney General of the United States reviewed it, and he made the decision not to charge the president of the United States with obstruction. So the other thing that has to be decided is what level of charges are brought. So let's, let's take an example in the news as well. 
Mr. Smollett out of Chicago. He's the one that purportedly faked a assault on himself. Um, <clears throat> initially, uh, they, the police wanted to bring multiple felony charges for each and every one of the um, lies that they claim were made in the police report. Uh, when this was reviewed by the prosecutor, the prosecutor said, well, if he'll forfeit his bond, which was $10,000, uh, and do community service, we'll drop the charges. And she said that this is a common occurrence when there's false police reports. It's what we do. In most jurisdictions, these r decisions are unreviewable. You, you can't go back and change them. You can't say, oh, well, you know, we really want to go forward. You have to remember that the prosecutors are elected officials. They are subject to both political pressure, politics, public pressure, what we expect from them. The defense attorney, what uh, I've done for 30 plus years, ensures that the government has to prove every part of the case against the defendant. Remember, the defendant, in theory, walks in with a presumption of innocence. And it is the job of the prosecution to prove that my guy did it. It's not my job to prove that my guy didn't do it. The assumption is he didn't do it. The prosecution has to prove he did. Every defendant, if you're going to face jail time, is entitled to an attorney. And this comes from the case of Gideon v. Wainwright. And one of the standards can be, did you get a good enough attorney? And this is a very weak standard. You might think, well, how good an attorney do I need? Do I get a really good attorney? And the answer is, not really. The Strickland standard says you can appeal if you can show that your counsel was not sufficient. But this is a pretty low standard. So what does the defense attorney do? Well, in theory, we can investigate. So if someone's charged with a crime, I can spend time trying to check it out. In, in practice, if it's court-appointed work, there's not a lot of time and effort that you can put into this because you've got lots of cases and very limited resources. The big thing that defense attorneys do is we talk to prosecutors and we engage in plea bargains because less than 5% of cases go to trial which means 95% per case, the percent of cases are plea bargains. So this is mostly what is done. If you are going to go to trial, you, s you prepare for trial. You also submit motions. Cases are won and lost based upon a motion, like this evidence shouldn't get in or this evidence should get in. And very often as those motions go forward, we get to see the prosecution defense, how the trial is likely to go, and then people decide whether they will or will not go to trial. If they're going to go to trial, you sit with them at the trial, and you handle the trial. You represent them. If they're convicted, you work with the judge to determine what the sentence should be, and if you're convicted and you feel it's unjust, you can appeal that conviction. There are two types of defense attorneys. Um, private attorneys, if you've got the money, you hire someone, and public defenders. 90% of all people accused of crime get public defenders. Um, the conviction rates are theoretically similar, although the actual sentence rates are not. So you have to be a little bit careful about that. Um, okay, attorney-client privilege. It is required um, that anything that my client tells me so my client might be communicating with me about um, what they were doing at the time they were accused of a crime, and maybe they were committing a minor crime. Someone's accused of murder, and the guy said, well, I wasn't murdering someone because I was selling drugs to Bob. I couldn't have killed Fred because I was selling bugs, uh, drugs to Bob. That's a confession of a, of, of a felony in, in many cases. But I can't go to the attorney, the prosecuting attorney, and say, well, you need to change the charge to, you know, selling drugs. Um, that is privileged. That goes nowhere. Now, there can be some exceptions if a client tells me I'm getting ready to commit a crime. Crime has not yet occurred. There's a crime in the future. Well, then, yes, I can uh, tell the prosecution about that or tell the police more properly about that. Um, if it's a past crime, however, nope, uh, it, it stays with me. All right, uh, on that note, we're only about 35 minutes in.
relatively short chapter. Uh, we'll be moving on to chapter 7 in a minute.